All right, so I am going to turn it over to our lovely interns in a second, but before I do so, I just wanna kind of run through what we're gonna to do today. So we started the Sacred Places Project in 2019, and we had three interns, and we did a lot of work on the groundwork, you know, identifying churches, kind of going through the plan with Sacred uh, Partners for Sacred Places, what we were gonna do, and starting the observational study and the interviews, which means looking at the outside of the building, and also taking tours. Um, we did about 28 churches. We actually did an interview in 2019 and we were all ready to go in 2020. And of course we had to postpone it. Um, we postponed in 2021 as well uh, with churches potentially being closed um, with uncertainties about COVID, we decided to wait. So we've now restarted in 2022 and uh, Lauren and George are going to run us through some of the trends and, and things that they've learned both from this year and from the information we gathered in 2019. And then once they kind of go over the presentation, uh, we're gonna have both Partners for Sacred Places and uh, Alan Schumann talk a little bit about their experiences. Um, and then we'll open it up for a discussion at the end. Uh, for those of you in the room, there are sheets. If you didn't get one, I have extras up here. There are surveys. Um, we'd just like you to fill them out before you leave um, some feedback for us to help guide the project. For those of you uh, who are online, when you leave the Zoom, there is a survey. So please just take a couple minutes and fill that out. We're gonna really appreciate that feedback. It's anonymous unless you wanna put your name on it. Um, that way you can feel free to say whatever, whatever you feel. All right, any questions before we get started? All right, then would you do me a favor? Someone press the little buttons on top of the speakers. They're a little white right now. If you press them, they'll go red. Perfect. Kevin, FYI, we lost any hearing at all. I guess I can't turn them off selectively. Apparently not. All right. Well, just keep in mind that there are microphones all down the table. Is there a clicker or something? Yeah, I got it. All right. So to start off, we have a sort of list of our goals for our project. Um, first one being to understand religious, economic, and demographic shifts in Reading to understand the history and state of historic congregations in the city along with their buildings, to discover how COVID affected the churches uh, financially, their attendance and their programs, and to identify opportunities and assets churches may have but may not be aware of. So for our project, we took a look at 96 historic sacred places in Reading that we identified. We did outside observational studies of all of them to assess building quality, entrance quality, window quality. Uh, or we, did we sat down over the course of 2019 and 2022 with a total of 53 congregation leaders. And then we followed up and did new interviews with 25 leaders to ask COVID specific questions. Kevin, would we be able to make this presentation available to people? Yes, we are recording this and we'll be made available to everybody who signed up or was interested. Okay, to start off with some general historical context, as many of you probably know, Pennsylvania was founded um, by William Penn and it was formed to be a land tolerant of all religions. And the Commonwealth was and still is diverse, but the original European settlers in Berks and Reading were largely German, along with Swedish, English, and French. Therefore, the two largest denominations were Lutheran and Reformed, in addition to Presbyterian, Catholic, Protestant Episcopal, Methodist Episcopal, Evangelical, and United Brethren. Reading was founded in 1748 with Penn Street as the center point. And throughout the years, Reading's industrial wealth helped expand city's population and with this infrastructure that branched further into the city, including many churches that house the growing religious community. 
Most, if not all, of the first congregations in the city began as small buildings, sometimes log, log structures, and bigger, more well-structured buildings were built often on the same property. And here we have an illustration of the first Reformed church on Washington Street. And on the right is what the building looks like today. Many churches raise funds themselves or first started as Sunday schools, as was the case with several Lutheran churches that branched off from their mother Trinity Church to reach members in other parts of the city. It's mentioned in an article written on Windsor Street Methodist dedication that even some members of other congregations and denominations gave financial support to their neighbors. George Baer, president of the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company, convinced Scottish architect Alexander Forbes Smith to relocate to Reading, and he helped commission some of his work. Forbes Smith designed churches such as the Unitarian Universalist Church on Franklin Street, St. Matthew's Lutheran on Fifth and Elm, and this picture you can see Grace Evangelical Congregational Church on Sixth and Elm, which is currently unoccupied, I believe. He also did additional work on several other churches throughout the city and in the region. And other financial contributors include individuals like Charles Duryea and Ferdinand Toon. Now let's discuss some numbers of the places of worship throughout the city throughout the years. Here we have a chart I created showing these numbers from 1847 to 1990. To get these, I went through the city directory for each city directory of each decade and counted how many places of worship were listed. And I tried to consistently exclude those were, that were outside of city limits, like West Law and Laurel Dale, that they have listed in the directory but aren't actually in the city. Um, it's important to acknowledge that these were based on which congregations were listed in the directory. Some of these could have been sharing spaces or worshiping in buildings that weren't the typical purpose built place of worship like they were focused on in the project. But this still gives you a basic idea of the overall trends. In 1847, the year Reading became a city, there were 14 places of worship. Throughout the years, those numbers increased and peaked in the 50s. The 1960 city directory lists about 117 places of worship within the city. With the rise of internet resources, city directories unfortunately faded out in the new millennium, and it's hard to get a clear picture of how many churches there were after this, but we can see the numbers slowly declining since the peak, though not as much as you might expect to see. Further support this trend here, we have a chart showing religiosity in America from 1952 to 2012 that gives a good visual of how church membership may have been affected throughout the years. There are many factors that have contributed to the peak in the 1950s and the gradual decline throughout the nation. During the years following World War II, soaring birth rates, economic good times, and the focus on normalcy and family converged to create the religious boom in the 50s. This, along with the idea that Christianity meant anti-communism, results in the huge increase in religiosity in the nation. Following this decade, social movements and revolutions in the 60s and 70s challenged the traditional church and its teachings. With the steady decline of religious adherence comes the lack of church attendance and furthermore the dissolving or merging of congregations that we have seen in the last few decades throughout, throughout the nation. And it's reported that the, de the decline now is twice as great as in the 60s and 70s. Today we predict there are about 100 places of worship in Reading overall, give or take. What we do know for sure, though, is that just in the time span that we've been working on the project, several longstanding congregations have or are planning on closing their doors, whether that is complete disband disbandment like Reading Moravian Church or through merging, as is the case with four Lutheran congregations we will hear about later. It's apparent there is a change happening in the city when it comes to religion and buildings the congregations are worshiping. And furthermore, there are several factors that play into the religious transitions we have seen in Reading. 
First off, many of the original congregants and their families have moved into the suburbs following the 50s. As with many city churches built during a time before cars, when people walk nearly everywhere they needed to, the individuals who designed Redding's churches did not anticipate each family needing a place to park their car when coming to worship services. The limiting parking may deter people in the suburbs from attending worship services in the city as they opt for churches closer to home. And those individuals who have been worshiping in the city for decades now are now elderly and may rather stay home and watch on the internet perhaps, or again, go to church, a church that's more easily. Well, the number of places of worship has only dropped slightly throughout the last few decades as the first chart shows. Many of the original congregations have disbanded and the spaces have been occupied by other congregations or have been repurposed. An important factor that plays into this is the change in demographics of the city. From 2000 to 2020, Reading's Hispanic population has jumped from 37% to 67%. Furthermore, 23% of the historically significant buildings on our list that were started by non-Hispanic white congregations are now occupied by Hispanic congregations. That number does not include buildings shared with that are shared with the Spanish congregation or ones that have a high Hispanic attendance, like many of the Catholic churches. So the involvement of Hispanics in Reading churches and, and religion in general is huge. Just of the 53 congregations we interviewed, 36% of churches have a significant Hispanic presence. 32 offer Spanish or bilingual services, and 23 are mainly Hispanic. Though these percentages are likely higher considering we only got to speak with leaders from a little over half of the congregations in the city. While their influence is evident, it's important to acknowledge that huge increase in Hispanic population is, is still not proportional to the congregational leadership in the city. The number of Hispanics has grown and likely makes up a large percentage of church attendance for many congregations, but the majority of churches are still being led by white leaders. Moving forward, let's look at the dominant denominations throughout the years. As I mentioned, with the county's large German population, the city consisted largely of Lutheran and Reformed churches. As, as families of European descent have moved outside city limits into the suburbs and beyond, Hispanic families have moved in, mainly from Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico, changing the dominant religion, religious adherence in the city. I copied some of the notable trends on this table showing changes in congregations and adherence in Berks County from 1980 to 2010. Given the high Hispanic population in Reading, the percent increases listed at the top of this table make a lot of sense, if you could see here. Many of the Hispanics in the community follow either Catholic or Pentecostal practices. As you can see, the number of Catholic adherents has increased greatly, but no new Catholic churches have been built in recent years. The number of Pentecostal adherents has also increased, but not nearly as significantly as Catholics. However, when it comes to churches in Reading that are actually being led by Hispanic leaders, Pentecostals have the higher number. And these are the congregations that are moving into the buildings, the buildings of disbanded congregations. I would predict that when the data from 2020 comes out, it will show an even greater increase in these congr the congregations from this denomination. Currently in Reading, the 8% of the churches on our list are easily identifiable as um, being Pentecostal. And in conclusion, as you can see, the city has undergone transition as any city does. And Reading started off as a place with mainly mainline Protestant and Catholic denominations of European descent who formed with, with small numbers and grew and expanded to reach members of all parts of the city. Now various shifts have created a place where new groups are forming, starting small and growing as their community grows within the city, just as the Lutheran and Reformed churches did in the past. Though religiosity in the nation is reportedly declining, religious ideals still play a huge role in the lives of those in Reading. 
And though some denominations are lacking in numbers while others grow, whether through community outreach, inclusion, or through their worship services, each, each works to find their purpose and way, <clears throat> excuse me, ways to best serve and reach the needs of those around them. So, excuse me. We just covered a little bit of the history of Reading. Now we're going to dive into what we found by interviewing the leaders and observing the churches. So to start off with the observational survey, again, we did 86 observational surveys. Uh, that was just us going and the other in 2019, going door to door, checking if there was any material damage done to the outsides of the buildings, the windows and the entrances. We found generally the outsides of the properties were in pretty good shape about 80 percent or more of the outside had no material loss and this generally represents an asset especially for churches who maybe their congregation sizes are struggling but they have a lot of uh, material assets that are more well established so we talked to congregation leaders 53 congregation leaders and we asked them to describe and walk through some of their congregants so we asked a couple questions. First about age, we found that they reported 54 was about the average age, but this was standardly distributed. So a lot of the growing congregations had uh, people on the younger side, more like the 40 to 50 range. And a lot of the other congregations had more in the 60 to 70 kind of range. City and non-city goers, this is another very interesting one. Churches generally are split sort of down the middle, either you're a city church or you're not a city church. We found most churches either have zero to 25% of people living in the city or some other churches had 75 to 100% of people living in the city. Uh, it really depends on the congregation. We found that 37% of congregants, the leaders reported anyway, were low income. Uh, from leader congregational leader surveys, it seemed that age and location seemed to be the primary factors. So people living on social security, or people receiving welfare checks seem to be the primary factors for low income. Uh, multi, this is sort of general of the congregational leaders. We interviewed multilingual, primarily Hispanic congregations tended to be a little bit larger. Um, and the average weekly attendance in total was about 35 members. So COVID, the last two years have been difficult for everybody. Congregation size actually did not change all that dramatically people quote unquote on the rolls down about seven percent in two years the biggest decrease we've seen is in terms of attendance leaders reported on average a 45 percent decrease in attendance which is great online worship helps supplement some of that attendance everybody switched to zoom for at least a couple months some people are still doing that some people are still not back online or still not back in person and older congregations tend to, tended to stay shut down for longer because they needed uh, extra precautions, more safety. And so older congregations with older members tended to uh, have fewer in-person attendance these last two years. So we also asked churches questions about programs and the kind of programs they run. Of the 20, this was in 2022. So we interviewed 25 churches about programs. We counted 118 programs, which is a good amount of programs for the churches that we interviewed. And this was actually down 36% uh, of all programming was shut down because of COVID. 68 programs continued to operate during COVID and 9% of programs were started within the last two years sort of during COVID. Most leaders are looking to restart programs. Basically, everybody we talk to is looking to do more. The problem is uh, some Congregations might lack the manpower, the volunteers to get it done. Some lack the funding to get it done. So COVID's effect on finances. Most churches, uh, when we interview people about finances, they saw tithing go down or stay level, reduce slightly. This was sort of in line with the reduction in spending. So as tithing went down because people went online, uh, they also saw the building utility expenses go down because it doesn't take as much as people for the building open. Uh, most churches rely primarily on tithing for income. Some have an endowment, but the churches were heavily biased in this because they had time to interview us. They're more likely to have an endowment, but primarily it's tithing that they rely on for income. PPP helped during COVID, but that was a temporary solution that kept them out of the red. 
again, this is biased. Uh, this is definitely above average, but 40% of the churches we interviewed had an endowment. Of the churches that we interviewed, the average endowment was about 458,000. We expect, uh, in terms of expenses, but also tithing, we expect these to go up as people return to in-person worship. Uh, we expect tithing to basically follow attendance. So if your attendance is rising with in-person, you expect your tithing to rise. If not, we expect your tithing to decrease. Uh, PPP, again, provided a temporary solution. We suspect congregation congregations with older members might be particularly vulnerable to this as they're less likely to either come back in person or they tend to be a smaller congregation size. So the takeaways, what do we learn? Hispanic congregations and newer Christian movements we talked about the Pentecostals a little bit. They're growing larger in Reading over the course of, you know, from the 1980s to 2020. We don't have the trend data for 2020, but we suspect it's growing even more than the 1980 to 2010. Uh, programming is likely to make a comeback. Hopefully it's likely to make a comeback as more church leaders are starting to ramp up and get back to in-person uh, most of the programs that were new that people started during COVID or after COVID was started in the past couple months. So we're hoping programming makes a full return. Um, and COVID frankly accelerated the rate of change that many congregations uh, are seeing in the city, the, tr the historical trends that we're seeing in Reading. And more established congregations have the various resources to help house growing congregations in the city or serve as an incubator, as an incubator, excuse me, as um some may call it. And there's a lot of potential for these buildings in terms of unused space or facilities. Many are taking the steps to utilize their spaces or have plans to, and this is important to preserve these historic buildings. And lastly, the adaptation adaptability, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, <laughs> adaptability of a congregation, their, their willingness to change with their community will be vital in the success of the church. That could mean bilingual or um, more contemporary services or being an open and affirming church, um, for example, or if they are declining in numbers, acknowledge that their building may be able to serve their community in a number of ways apart from Sunday services. So that was our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone that we interviewed. It was great to hear from all of you. I want to thank Lauren and George. Something that they didn't specifically mention was that when we did this, we didn't necessarily have a specific criteria for what a historic church was. Um, but we figured an older building, something that's architecturally uh, significant, maybe has a lot of significant artwork in it, and came up with a list of, you know, almost 100 churches. Getting through 53 of them is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. They called, emailed, um, visited, uh, went on Google Maps and found information um, through looking at the signs, trying to find numbers to call. And I think that speaks to the fact that we are seeing so many of these congregations, they're struggling, they're small, they have part-time staff, maybe they don't have any staff, it's all volunteer. So we know that what we learned reflects that. There are a lot of congregations that didn't have the time or the staff to meet um, with Lauren or George, or maybe there was no one even to get a hold of. So as we think about this, I think we have to keep in mind that we were lucky enough to get to about half of the churches we identified, but we know there's so many more voices and experiences out there that um, may paint a slightly different picture that we were unable to, to reach. So with that, uh, I want to open it up if anybody has any questions um, about the presentation, about what you saw. Um, we can have a little bit of a discussion about that, and I do want to turn it over to partners to talk a little bit more about kind of the larger picture and what they do. Um, and again, Alan Schumann to talk about his uh, experience with Hopewell Mennonite. So any questions? You want me to put everybody up? Yeah, I think so. All right.
Well, if we have no questions, I will turn over to Shelly uh, and to Joshua to lead us through a little bit more about what they do and a little bit bigger picture. You are muted still. I got that. <laughs> Kevin, can I screen share? You can. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so um, Joshua and I, as we said, work for Partners for Sacred Places. Partners for Sacred Places is a um, national not-for-profit. We uh, work with older and historic uh, church buildings, and our definition of older and historic um, is about anything older than 50 years, or a building that may have housed some important historic event. Uh, we have worked with some um, congregations in the South in particular that may be younger, but ha had a significant impact during the civil rights movement, for example. Um, we work with those congregations in several ways. One is a concern for the stewardship and care of buildings. Uh, we are, uh, in, in our founding, a preservation organization, but we preserve in order to encourage congregations not only to use the buildings for themselves, but to open up for community use and engagement. And we have done a, a lot of work over the years on the civic value of sacred places. And I want to talk just for a moment about that. In the 90s, Partners was asking all kinds of questions about buildings, who's served by programs that are in sacred places. Um, are congregations opening their buildings sacrificially, which means uh, are they not charging market rate for uh, people to use and programs to use the space? What cultural value do they bring to a community? And is there a strengthening and stabilizing factor? They engaged in a process um, that resulted in a publication called Sacred Places at Risk. You can find this on our website, sacredplaces.org. Uh, more about Sacred Places at Risk. Uh, one of the things that is most interesting that they discovered is that the people who are using the typical uh, church building, 81% of them are not members of the congregation, 81%. They are not there uh, primarily to worship on Sunday. They're there for daycare. They're there for a feeding program. Uh, they're there for some kind of an educational event. They're there for counseling. Uh, this was a huge finding because it really began to open up an understanding that sacred places have uh, value. And that resulted in work that was done with the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the School of Social Policy and Practice there, social workers, uh, to look at the economic impact of sacred places. Because what we know is that in terms of people who are not part of a religious community, people who are in civic life, in government, um, the value of a place, if it is, can be monetized, can be understood in different ways. And so we began to try to figure out, working with people um, in the School of Social Work, um, how can we monetize the value of a sacred place? So they looked at local spending, local hiring, um, building maintenance, the spending of visitors. So somebody who comes to a wedding at a church, do they uh, stay in a hotel? Do they eat dinner at a restaurant? Um, what activities do the churches do that promote community economic development? The impact on individual lives in, in programs like 12-step groups, um, values inherent in older religious properties. Is there green space in the middle of a city, for example? Is there recreation space? Uh, is, is the beauty of the place itself contributing uh, to the value of people's lives. And this is what they came up with, a formula that determined in um, three cities, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Fort Worth that were studied. This is urban congregations. 
that the average annual economic halo value, halo is what we call it, um, the halo value of a congregation, it's $1,700,000 a year. You heard that correctly. And that comes from a, a variety, these variety of different categories, direct spending. Um, so many congregations, so many sacred places house educational programs from daycare to Head Start to after school programs. Um, the invisible safety net. Uh, so what would happen in Reading today if every single sacred place closed down? Uh, a lot of places found that out during COVID because suddenly there were feeding programs and housing programs, clothing, counseling programs, all sorts of things that were not available to the community that really strained the public safety net. Uh, the magnet effect is, you know, drawing people in for events and <clears throat> other activities that resulted in other spending. So the invisible safety net is, is the biggest one, that 87% of the beneficiaries of the, the safety net activities of any congregation, 87% are not members. We did more recently um, <coughs> HALO research in North Carolina to look at rural churches to see if it was similar. And they came up with uh, the figure of $735,000 there, the same kinds of categories. So even in a rural setting, this is huge. So at Partners, because of this, um, we <coughs> care very much about what happens to sacred places for a variety of reasons, for the preservation of, of history and architecture and beauty in a community, and for the preservation of places where these kinds of service activities <laughs> can take place. So what Partners does, in addition to doing things like the training that we did for the interns, um, at, at um, Burke's Community Foundation in order to do your project is we also do consulting services with congregations to help them do fundraising um, to preserve their places. We do programs and trainings around adaptive reuse and space sharing. We have arts in the sacred places programs in Philadelphia and New York City. Um, our core <coughs> program is New Dollars, New Partners, helping congregations to reach out into their community for support. Um, we also are well aware of what's going on right now um, that the interns presentation alluded to in the dramatic decrease in the amount of people in church buildings and the huge number of church buildings that are being closed or repurposed in some way. And so we provide, we work with congregations on transition services to try to, to see that those buildings continue to be used in the service of the community and in line with the legacy of the founders of those buildings and the mission and vision. We continue to do research um, on public policy and our newest publication is in the transitions field, transitioning older and historic sacred places, which you can download for free from our website, sacredplaces.org. It walks congregations through a process of assessment in terms of their relationship with their building and suggests uh, several different ways um, that that building mm -hmm. might be transformed and their relationship with that building possibly continue. Um, it really is a terrific piece. Joshua was one of the authors uh, of that. We work with capacity building um, and we train congregations in how to initiate and manage shared space partnerships. Those of you um, from Christchurch, Reading, we just did an asset mapping event with them and they can tell you more about what that was about in terms of trying to increase space sharing for them. And the asset mapping piece is what we just did. You can talk with them more about that. It leads to new initiatives, new programming, new partnerships, as well as new research. We do something called design charrettes. Um, Joshua can tell you more about that if you have questions, which brings together architects and designers and planners with input from congregation and the community via asset mapping to, to sort of identify new ways that the, the congregation's building, building might be adapted to accommodate new and expanded space use. 
Um, and we, we try to do some matchmaking um, with congregations and possible tenants and then guidance to both of them on how to make the, the most of that space. In the transitions work that we do, we help try to help congregations understand that what transitions does not necessarily mean is your congregation leaving the building and the building either becoming um, high-end condos, um, a bar, or staying empty. Um, that there are options like remaining in place with significant space sharing, sometimes with an anchor tenant in the building, retaining a presence while potentially changing ownership, selling the building, but having a long-term lease back of space, using financial and development incentives to stay, um, things like ground leases or in some cities, um, airspace, parking lots, can, if you've got them, um, can become a financial incentive to work with others. And then sometimes sale, but sale consistent with mission and values and legacy in mind, mainly hoping that the community services can continue to find a place in these congregations. We know congregations that have turned their, have sold their buildings, for example, to WISE or to other arts organizations or nonprofits to continue to serve the community. So I'm going to stop there because I've loaded you up with enough information. Joshua, I don't know if you want to say a word or um, we can go to um, questions uh, if anybody has them about partners work. We are, by the way, headquartered in the city of Philadelphia, which is where Joshua is. Um, I'm in Connecticut. We also have staff in Chicago and New York City and Nashville uh, and Baltimore and Detroit. Shelly, I think you've covered so much um, and in really great detail about what we do, but also I think underscoring kind of our, what I always like to call our philosophy around the public value of historic sacred places and how they really are community assets, even though we so often tend to think about their challenges and, and their struggles, um, they are still providing incredible value and, and far beyond just their cultural heritage. So I'll be around for questions and able to be reached afterwards, but I think you've really um, covered so much of the good ground here. Thanks. Well, thank you both uh, very much. Uh, I wanna highlight that piece about the services that a lot of these uh, buildings and their congregations are providing. Um, we can think of examples very easily. Um, there are some with uh, space sharing. So Calvary, for example, on Center Avenue has the LGBT Center in it. Um, the uh, Islamic Society of Berks County moved into what was uh, a Methodist church at Front and Windsor, and they're having their services and providing other uh, services there. And we can think about uh, the daycares, the after-school programs, um, even things like New Journey Community Outreach. That's a really good example where the church had a mission, had an interest. And even though the church itself closed and they partnered with the, the Methodist and West Lawn, they wanted to keep that value, that mission-driven value alive. And so it became New Journey Community Outreach. Uh, we actually have two examples here at the Community Foundation for congregations that have closed, but wanted to continue their missions. And what they did was they took their endowments and their assets and they used them to create a fund here with us, the Community Foundation, um, the first UCC and the St. John's UCC funds, every year we make grants that support what they want as part of their mission. So those are things like providing youth with access to activities the other whites couldn't afford, um, things for St. John specifically, directly around the community in Southeastern Reading where they were. So we know that there's so much mission work happening that's not just the religious services, um, and it's happening here in the city, it's happening around Berks County. So that's a really important piece. The other piece that they mentioned was the idea of transition. Okay, so transition could mean many things. It could mean closing the church. It could mean sharing space. And I've invited uh, Alan Schumann to join us today as someone, private developer with experience with this, with the Hope O'Manite Church on South 6th Street. So Alan, would you mind maybe five, 10 minutes, talk a little bit about your experience with um, Hope O'Manite? Sure. Um, for those of you who are, are not familiar with it, I think you've got a, a interior photo you can put up on screen. So this was a uh, or is a church on uh, the first block of South Sixth Street in downtown Reading, built in 1852, massively renovated in 1892. 
Um, in the 1980s, it, the congregation had sold the church to Hopewell Mennonite uh, group that relocated to downtown Reading. They had 480 members in the 1980s by about 19, or excuse me, by about 2005, 2010, they were down to just a, a dozen or so members of this church. They had mothballed the, the, the sanctuary that you see here. They were operating out of uh, uh, two small rooms on the first floor of the building. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the building, while beautiful, um, had a, a Vermont slate roof put on in 1892, and the structure was not reinforced enough to handle that roof. So if you look on the right-hand side of the photo, you will see the wall bowing out and separating from the, the wood, uh, wood trim there. So the city condemned it in 2017. Uh, they the Hopewell Mennonite congregation, the last 12 members, spent the next two years, 2017 to 2019, begging, um, uh, they told me, 23 different uh, uh, groups to take over the church for uh, free. They would donate it to them as long as they would put up the funds to save it. Um, of course, it was not occupiable um, due to the condemnation by the, the city of Reading, the structural condemnation. So after they met with the, the political leaders at the time, the city administration, everybody wanted to help, but nobody could help. Um, of course, in the United States, there's a separation of church and state. So you can't use taxpayer monies for a private religious facility. Um, and uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, nobody else, none of the other religious groups that they had contacted or nonprofits had the kind of funds that would be needed to save the structure here. Um, so finally, in November of 2019, uh, they called me up and said that their, um, their structural engineer told them if the roof gets more than four to six inches of snow on it, the building's going to collapse. Uh, and we're in November and winter's coming. So at that point, they called me up. I had never met with them before, whatever, and they begged me to come down and take a look at the church. They said that they would give me the church if I would just put the funds up to restore it and, and have uh, or stabilize it and make a good faith effort to try to save the structure. It does not look like anything significant on the outside, so I was not very motivated. Um, but then they got me inside and I saw what you see here in this photo. And uh, uh, at that point, I agreed. And within the next four weeks, we had uh, uh, the entire inside of the building, um, scaffolding built up to the ceiling, steel cables and trusses everywhere to hold the sides together. Um, and we took possession of that building. We tried with two different uh, religious groups to work out long-term leases um, to try to help us offset the tax consequences of. Uh, of it being privately owned. We were unable to work out um, uh, something that, uh, that would work with, with any of those groups or either of those groups. So it is now privately owned, paying taxes. Uh, we do make it available for non-denominational weddings, events, Reading Choir Society, uh, Reading Players Club, uh, theater groups, and basically rent it out as a uh, a uh, uh, event hall. Um, you know, it's got a, another whole level below this, almost this same size. And we're in the process now. Um, of course, we have to pay taxes. We're a tax paying entity, so we can actually apply for federal tax credits um, to offset those tax credits and or offset the cost of the building. And uh, it, we are now moving forward with having it registered on the National Register of Historic Places, which will give us additional tax credits for the renovations of the project. And that's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell that we've done with the building. I don't know if you were looking for anything more specific, Kevin, but... <clears throat> No, that's great. Thank you. We'll open up the, the questions in a second. Questions for Alan, questions for partners, questions for us in general. Um, one thing I, I want to build off of what he was saying there was we see these buildings being sold or basically gifted away for a dollar, which 
maybe is good in the short term. It brings another congregation in, oftentimes a Spanish congregation. They may have the numbers. They may have some volunteer labor to help maintain the building, but they don't have the resources it takes to adequately fix, repair, and restore these buildings. So it can help in the short term with the building itself, with having people in there to make sure there's someone paying attention. But you still end up in the situation that, you know, with Hopewell Mennonite where they just do not have the resources to maintain these buildings. And that's a concern that we have is what happens when we have 80 some beautiful historic buildings with, with history in them downtown and around the city and around the county as well. I mean, we focused on the city for this project, but this is also true around the county. What happens when those congregations can no longer support them or no longer want to support them, don't have the resources to support the buildings? What happens next? So I think that this was a very interesting project for us to learn about what's happening in the city. We have amazing experts here with Partners for Sacred Places, Alan Schumann doing a lot of historic development in the community. So I wanna open it up to the group, have a little bit of a conversation about this. <clears throat> now, we are very interested in learning um, maybe about individual experiences you have or the, the kind of uh, programs you're, you're doing at your, your congregations. And ultimately when we leave here today, we want to hope that you have a better picture of what's happening in the city. And we want to make sure we have feedback from you about where can we go next with this project. Um, I mentioned the two funds, St. John's and First UCC. Those provide mission-oriented funds. Um, we did a walking tour uh, about a month or two ago now, and some ideas came up. For example, downtown churches used to do a Christmas tour. Is that something that can be happening again that's obviously benefiting the, the church and the congregations by bringing people in, but also is a fun event for our community. So I will turn it over to you all now. Um, if you want to ask any questions, go ahead or, or share your experience. We'd love to hear it. I would be Kevin, willing to accept that Kevin. for sure. So why I? Kevin, I just wanted Kevin. to, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I did is somebody speaking? I can't tell because I'm online. Yeah. Kevin, we wanted to comment on something that Alan said, just to clarify it, if if we could, a sec before sure. General. Hey, yeah, I, I was going to say, well, firstly, kudos to you, um, Alan, for saving such a beautiful building. I, I would just thought it was a stunning, stunning facility and, and just amazing work that you did to believe that it could be saved and investing all your time and resources into making that project work. I just wanted to add a quick note, and, and maybe Shelley will jump in on, about... Um, funding for historic religious properties that are still being used by religion. Um, uh, the church and state rule really uh, mostly affects um, funding that would go to religious programming, things like worship, the support of clergy, um, specific religious activities. But there actually is in public law a broad support at the national level, absolutely, and at the state level, case by case, um, for the support of um, religious structures that are historic. So historic religious properties qualify for grants, um, for historic preservation grants um, to restore those facilities. And that happened in Pennsylvania, especially through the uh, Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, um, which, can which can provide congregations with planning grants, you know, architectural studies and assessments, as well as capital um, uh, project grants as well. Um, some states do not based on the particular state's regulations around supporting or getting entangled with religion. At the national level, actually um, congregations, even though they're nonprofits, if they have a large enough project, they can also uh, avail themselves of the tax credit program at the national level as well. Um, and there have been, uh, and there still are grants at the, there have been uh, certainly grants at the national level through the National Park Service that con active congregations can actually access to support their historic buildings. So there is, there is a, a record of funding and there is funding, support for funding for historic houses of worship that are still being used by congregations, but specifically to restore or repair their buildings and their properties. Um, so there is support for that. And actually in, in Pennsylvania, there's also the RACP program, um, which has provided um, at this point millions of dollars for um, historic religious properties. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because there is this sort of, it's not quite a loophole, but it is a, an exception or a particular kind of uh, niche where religious entities are allowed to access public money. Can I make a comment here? Yeah, do you want to talk about that? 
I'm Pam Wheaton. I wanted to just follow up. That's Joshua, right? Yeah. Um, Joshua, can you clarify also the um, church's ability to tap into some community development block grant funding, especially if they can document what percentage of the space and time is dedicated to non-worship, non-religious, um, uh, you know, programs. So in other words, in, Allen, in Allen's particular case, where the, the facility is really not being used for worship, um, there should be a way that some community development block grant funding can go that direction. Yeah, CDBG funding is really interesting because there are obviously guidelines that are laid down by HUD, but each regional office um, then divvies up those funds to the local governments. And the local governments are the ones that actually write their own rules for how they want, within the guidelines that HUD provides, for how they want to give away that money. So uh, it's best to know what your local rules are. And I don't always, know, I don't know what everybody's local rules are. Like I worked for a city government, for instance, where a huge amount of money went to religious properties for non-programmatic, but actually some programmatic uses that were not religious in nature, that were community service, as well as capital projects. Some communities I've heard don't fund any, you know, don't fund any programs. It's only capital or churches are, and religious properties are totally excluded. So the best way to understand your rules are to actually talk to your local elected officials and have them connect you with the right officers in local government who manage or oversee um, those programs uh, to understand. Because um, it, 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 the community, get, it, they're literally block grants, right? So each municipality gets a huge amount and then they kind of can write their, their rules about how they want to disperse that money and allocate it each time. So it's best to know in your community how it works. I would, I would add too for private funding, like the community foundation, we generally, unless we have a fund that's meant specifically to support religious services, we generally aren't funding the religious services. But we are funding things like after school programs, daycare programs. Those are very common. Um, in fact, I think it was first UCC. Um, this year we funded a manual UCC over in, in right next to Mifflin for their um, like summer, summer school program. So it, if it's not a specifically a religious service, there are a lot of other funding opportunities. I'd like to thank Berks County Community Foundation for funding the uh, community asset mapping activity. Um, Alan Sch Schumann sat on our advisory board for that. And we just finished that session, uh, held the session on July 27th. I'd be happy to share some of the information from that. Um, and we have a history of working with sacred places that goes back to 2009. We're actually participated in their new dollars, new partners, program in 2009. So, and, you know, when at some appropriate time, I'd be happy to talk more about that, that what our experience has been with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Alan Schumann. Alan, it's Kevin Murphy. Um, what's your long-term vision for the use of Hopewell uh, Mennonite, uh, which is truly a spectacular building, but Ironically, I was invited to tour it the week after they condemned it. And they didn't tell me it was condemned until I was in the building. <laughs> uh, so, so one of the reasons we were interested in that building particularly, it, it, it specifically was because we have the, the two large office buildings within half a block of there, the Exide building and the Wells Fargo building, each 140,000 square foot office buildings. So right now we're in the process of doing a $16 million new market tax credit application that will uh, redo the Wells Fargo building that is currently vacant from Wells Fargo moving out three months ago and do the, the church in conjunction with that. We plan on spending about $3 million on a church facility to completely restore it. We're going to be putting restaurants throughout the first floor of the Wells Fargo building. And the hope is that having six restaurants there plus the four restaurants across the street at 35, or excuse me, at 645 Penn Street at the Exide building, they will utilize the space there, um, both the first floor and the upper floor for events uh, of their own right on that block, banquets and, and corporate events, all those kind of things. So really give it a weekly use in addition to 
uh, you know, the ongoing weddings and things that we have every Saturday and Sunday there. It cannot, right. so the church cannot, or the building cannot stand on its own. Um, it, you know, there was just no way that it could support its own cleaning staff, maintenance staff, security, all, all those things you need. But having it be part of that group of those two big office buildings, half of, you know, on the adjacent block, allows it to have all that staff and and you know it's just a piece of, of of really our whole operation there you put football in there <laughs> uh is it primarily weddings at this point for events uh yes every saturday uh it, uh, it is booked for weddings. Um, we get a huge amount of non-denominational weddings. I think we're the number one non-denominational wedding location in Berks County. Uh, and uh, it, so it's booked every Saturday for that. And then occasionally uh, throughout the week, again, for the, the, the theater groups or the choir society uh, and those kind of things. So for those of you who are representing a, a congregation or if you're just a member of a congregation, how are your congregations thinking about your spaces into the future? Are you concerned about the upkeep and the maintenance? Are you looking for ways to maybe share space or, or you know, even just have a little extra help paying the bills at the location? Like what, what are your concerns? I'll share a little bit. Um, so our building is Hope of the Nations Christian Center at 134 North 5th Street. So it is not a traditional historic church, but it is a historic building within a historic um, district. So one of the challenges when the church was originally purchased, well, it was um, former Jewish Luton's Natatorium is what it originally was. What oh, was it? A swimming pool. In the yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, that was... <laughs> Luden. Excuse me, William, William Luden built the first indoor swimming pool in Berks County there. Oh. The swimming pool is still there. Yes, it is. About five years ago, I had the opportunity to go underneath the floor okay. for a day. So <laughs> went for a dry swim, in other words. So, <laughs> Oh, that's really interesting to hear. But um, so we have over 21,000 square feet of space that we're using the... Um, we have a main sanctuary, but we have a cafe there that has closed. Not It did not close due to COVID. It closed back in 2018. But we have uh, we applied for an American Recovery Plan grant, and we were given that. So we've, we're working with an architect right now to do a feasibility study. The building is in, a lot of it is in disrepair. Um, that section under, that area underneath, um, the sanctuary um there's old saunas down there there it was yes yeah yeah there was i kind of remember back in like the early 80s there was a health club that wanted to try and open there but i don't know if it ever did well it looks like they may have i mean it was hours down there it was and, jcc for quite a while yeah. and briefly between 1910 and 1914 it was actually the ymca okay. yeah when the ymca sold their penn street property to open the washington street they sold the building first so they need to rent quarters. So they rented quarters at Luton's Natatorium to be able to you know, offset that cost or help pay for the, the Washington Street building. It's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. But so right now we have the cafe and what, what we would like to do is we would like to start an entrepreneurial type training program for um, youth <coughs> at that location and use the cafe as an actual entrepreneurial type experiential training for those <clears throat> who have a desire to open a business, not necessarily a cafe, but to give them that uh, opportunity to have real life hands-on practice. But where we're at right now is finding the funding to do all of this. We have the vision and, you know, I know a lot of churches have the vision. And I think one of the challenges that we have, and I, you know, I don't want to speak for others, but I think is having the expertise on how to move forward, how to raise funds, how to really take those next steps to turn the space into something that benefits the community, 
perhaps um, provide some economic you know, development or um, income for the community. I really liked what was shared about the value that churches bring to the community. So um, from our perspective, we have the vision, we have the desire, we've started the process, we're taking it one step at a time. But, you know, I think this um, Partners for Sacred Places, it sounds like they have great resources um, that could perhaps help us in this process. But um, I think as a whole, churches need that um, assistance and that help because we're not experts in those in those things. So anyway. Kevin knows how to get a hold of us. Give us a buzz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> Would you like me to say a few words about the community asset mapping? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as I said, uh, Christ Episcopal Church, we are, we're approaching our 200th anniversary. We're right at, right on the corner of Court and and Fifth, and um, the church was founded by a lot of the early influential business business people in the city of Reading. So, like the founder of the Reading Eagle was uh, was a vestry member, and um, Stricter, who had that hardware store somewhere along Penn Avenue, he was a he was a member of the congregation. So we have a long history, we have a long history of involvement in the community. Um, a lot of people who participated on the advisory board uh, for the community asset mapping and people who attended the meeting didn't realize things that uh, like the fact that Opportunity House actually started in our basement, it started as the first emergency shelter for the city of Reading, um, where our rector just started inviting homeless, homeless to stay in our courtyard. And then when the weather got cold into the basement and eventually the funding came came about to, I don't know where the funding came from, to spin off and become Opportunity House. Also, we have uh, at one point took a second mortgage and uh, built the Episcopal Senior Housing Facility in the city of Reading. So we had, so service to the community is in our DNA. And we really, as we were approaching our 200th anniversary, felt that we needed to get a handle on that. Um, we are changing as a congregation. We realize we need to be doing more uh, for our neighbors in the in the area, so we started to look at a, a few things. One is we had a very we had a urgent need to do some renovation on the historic structure, so we applied for a, um, a construction grant to the Pennsylvania State uh, Historic and Museum Commission to support our buttress work because the buttresses support that two hundred and fifty. But steeple, um, we wanted to be sure there was some uh, water infiltration. We were we were awarded the grant, and that that grant led us to renew our connection. This is where I'm going with this with sacred places. Um, we we finished the buttress work, but in the process, we had applied for another uh, submitted a letter of interest for another grant, and. We were told we weren't nicely told we weren't ready for that, not from sacred places. This is from the National Trust, but it, they introduced us again to uh, partners for sacred places. So after that, we built on the state grant by asking partners to do a feasibility study. What whether we had the capacity to raise funds in this community, how many people knew about Christ Episcopal Church? What did they know about us? They interviewed about 45 people and prepared a report for us that, that said, yes, they felt that we had the, the capability to raise some money here to do additional work on our, on our structure. Um, after that, uh, we decided to do a community asset mapping. So we're, we're moving down a path to get us to our 200th anniversary and we applied nicely to Berks County Community Foundation for some funding to offset the cost for the um, community asset mapping. That process, we, we pulled together an advisory committee of approximately 10 to 12 persons from the community. Um, John Loyak from Alvernia University, president of Alvernia University, members from the Greater Chamber Reading of uh, Greater Chamber, Chamber Alliance, Chamber Alliance 
um, uh, Mike Toledo from Centro Hispano, Alan Schumann, um, all people that we felt would be would have the ability to reach out to other members of the community to bring them in to do this mapping. So with that, we identified 100 community organizations that we wanted to invite. I am pleased to say that 60, more than 60 responded that they would be there on July 27th, which I think was almost a record or may have been a record for, for uh, partners. Um, it was a large group. We, we, it was a very exciting session. It took us six to eight months to plan, but we were able to pull together 60 community members. Parking was an issue, but Alan stepped in and let us use the uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and basically community people toured the facility because we are concerned about the use of our space. Uh, they toured the facility and then brainstormed for about an hour on ways that we might be able to develop new partnerships and collaborations and new directions for Christ Episcopal Church as we move forward. We're here to stay. I don't think that we are going to be closing at any point soon, but you never know with a bishop, right? But, but we're here to stay. We want to stay. We want to be vital to downtown Reading. Um, and uh, this activity Partners is now uh, compiling a report for us. It will be distributed to every uh, organization that attended the, the mapping session. And um, we have already had, like for, for instance, we've already had uh, a partnership, a collaboration with Centro Hispano. They needed to vacate their building here that's being you know, redone. They asked us whether we would be able to house for a temporary period until their new facility was ready. Their senior, their senior center, their Amistad program. So every day, Monday through Friday now, the Amistad program is being housed in our fellowship hall. Um, we've Since this asset mapping activity alone, we've had three or four community organizations contact us and say they want to, they want to be working with us. Uh, Burke's Youth Chorus is gonna be using our choir room for their rehearsals and doing a concert in May. So they'll be, there 39 times this um, this year. Uh, we've had interest from Bethany Ministries. We've had Tower Health reach out to us most recently to try and do some programming that would be of benefit to the community members and seniors and other community members. Um, I don't I don't have details on that yet, but that just literally happened yesterday. So it was definitely a worthwhile experience. Um, the next step is for us to do strategic visioning with sacred partners for sacred places. And then I don't know where it would go from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, we also received another state grant. Um, it, it, they call it a planning grant. Right now we are working with um, an architectural firm to do a complete architectural assessment of the facility. And that will help us identify the most urgent needs should we decide to go forward with trying to do some fundraising to help with the uh, structure itself. Do you have any questions? So community uh, asset mapping is just identifying within the community, those organizations that serve the community. Can you just kind of- Yeah, um, the, the concept is that Every, every organization has their own assets. So what the mapping does is it, it's, it says, okay, here's what our mission is and here's what we have to offer the community. Here's what your mission is and what you have to offer the community. Is there a way to bring some of those together to build synergies and collaborations? I'm um, Deborah Groff, Trinity Reading. A lot of the conversation has been about restoring, repairing our structures. Um, does that include renovating in order to make it more accessible or at, is it only about the repairing? I think that's a good question. Um, and Pastor Bennett, I don't know if you were to talk about, is it St. Luke's that they're using because there's parking and there's an elevator for the four congregations that are emerging. Bob is here. He's one of the pastors. Yeah. Before, yeah. 
All right, so let me combine about 600 years into four minutes, um, <laughs> because we have four Lutheran churches that are preparing to merge into one. It started way back in 2015, where three churches started having conversations, relationships, and sharing activities. Uh, and then as it came to 2019, the three churches said, it's time for the next step in our relationship. Are we willing to risk losing our building? To make, to make a stronger congregation. And one of the three said no. So it was down to two. But at the same moment, the one said no, there were two others, including my Holy Spirit service, said, um, we heard about something going on. Could we join the conversation? So in mid-2019, four churches, two fresh to the conversation, two reloading the conversation, started talking about the possibility of merging. Um, we voted at the end of 2019 to at least look into the process, and then COVID hit, as we have heard many times before. But still, as 2021 came, towards the end of 2021, we had the vote, which where each individual church had to say yes by a two-thirds majority to actually commit to the merger process. Um, and one church was 100%, and mine was like 69%, so... Barely a yes, but a yes. Uh, and now the last year or so has been ironing out some of the details. So in theory, if everything goes smoothly for the next month, uh, on October 1st, you can add three Lutheran churches that no longer exist and one which technically will end up going through a name change. Uh, so for you who are geographically able, um, Holy Spirit Lutheran on uh, Windsor Street in Center Park, St. John's German Lutheran Church on Walnut, St. Luke's Lutheran on 9th, and Grace Lutheran on 11th. Those are the four. We are merging into the name of St. John's on Walnut because they're the ones with the big endowment with the restrictions. So on paper, we're merging into St. John's. But in location, we are going to be merging into St. Luke's because they have the biggest building, the best parking, which is not great, but it's the best event we are planning to hopefully renovate St. Luke's to make it, bring it up to code and modernize it. So the thing is when October 1st comes, we're gonna have four church buildings, an office building and a cemetery. And we don't need all of those. We might need two buildings because if we renovate St. Luke's, you know renovations is cheaper and quicker if you get out. So we might need two, but we don't need four. And by the way, Alan, good to meet you. I did a wedding there a couple of months ago. So it was a nice place. Um, and there, definitely Sacred Places is a name that my future co-pastor, Pastor Sonia Ware, has mentioned many times. Um, so come October 1st, there will be a new congregation with a new name and two co-pastors, Pastor Sonia and myself, and a whole lot of questions going forward. Well, thank you for sharing. And I, I wanted to point to that because one of the reasons that that church was chosen as, well, St. Luke's is where they're going to go is because it has those facilities. It has parking. I think it has some accessibility, at least. It does have some, but it needs really to be upgraded. And we know that that's an issue. Um, with the age of the, the congregants that we saw here, a lot of these congregations are 50s, 60s, 70s. Accessibility is not only important for the congregation, but also for the 81% of people who are not in the congregation that they're serving. So I do think that that's a, a very important piece. And there, yeah. there often is money available um, in varying places to help with um, becoming ADA compliant. That requires a little bit of research. Uh, and sometimes it can be money in the city, it can be money in the state, um, it can be money from independent foundations. Kevin, I don't know if there's anything happening at Burks along those lines, but or if you all are, have connections, but it's definitely worth trying. And folks in the Lutheran churches, God bless you and good luck. And um, one of the things that our transitions program is looking at is folk like you who now all of a sudden have property that that uh, needs to be uh, dealt with. So I hope you'll undergo a process of connecting with the community. Talk to the folks at, folks at Christ Church to figure out where what happens to those buildings. Before I say anything else, I, I feel obligated to tell everybody uh, the Hopewell Mennonite property, that was Second Reformed Church. It, if you don't know that history, I that was one of ours first. Uh, but uh, 
I've been pastor of St. Andrews uh, for over 30 years now. And uh, even in the time that I've been there, uh, the church was always a, an active community center. Uh, and the reality of the situation in our residential neighborhood is that all of those outreach programs have been strangled because there's no parking. Uh, I mean, not even enough parking that you wanted to create a program to serve the community and you had to have some equipment brought in or some facilitators brought in. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure um, what the help is for that. Uh, although, you know, my current vision is that up on the corner from us is what was uh, back in the day St. Cecilia Roman Catholic Chapel, which is condemned, and the, 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 the spire on the tower is collapsing in. Um, and nobody's going to do anything with that until the building actually falls in, and then the city will have to clean it up, and then maybe at some point we can scrounge together some money to get a parking lot. Um, but both of my congregations, and I'm only serving all of it for three years now, uh, we also have the, the accessibility issue. Uh, St. Andrews is not terribly impractical just because of the way it's built, but it's not ADA compliant in any stretch. Uh, and earlier this summer, I was contacted by Lancaster Seminary. They wanted to have an event here, just a one-day event. I tell them, well, you, St. Andrews is probably not where you want to go because there's no parking. And all of it, which is smaller, has parking, but you need to understand that there's only one. You have to go up at least three steps to get in the building. And if you want to go to the bathroom, then you have to go down a flight of steps because there's one bathroom. So, you know, we, we, we have those accessibility issues if you try to create community programming now, because a lot of it you know, it, it, the buildings are just not practical enough. Um, it is almost one o'clock, so I want to respect people's times. We can continue, but I just want to mention before you leave, if you don't have one already, please, uh, I have surveys here. Um, if you don't have time to finish it today, you can take it with you and send it back to me. We want to collect a little bit of feedback from you. And same thing for those of you who are joining us online. When you leave the Zoom, it will pop up a survey. Please take a minute to fill that out before you leave, but we can continue the conversation. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to have to leave. Thank you to all of you. And um, again, Kevin knows how to find us. Thanks, Thank Shelley. you. Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll stick around for a little bit if you have questions, you want to talk some more. Um, the parking piece is interesting. Obviously, the city's dealing with parking right now, trying to do parking studies, trying to find some solutions. Um, one thing that I would encourage, um, I'm not sure what the rules are around exactly in the city, but it's a shared parking. Um, you know, your congregations may only need it Saturday and Sunday for service, or maybe you need it at nighttime for programming, and a business may need it during the day. So if there are ways you can partner, um, that's always a good opportunity. It can be challenging, but a good opportunity. So Thank you all for coming. Um, what I'm gonna be doing is I will be sharing out a recording of this, both to everybody who was here, as well as everybody who wanted to be but could not attend, um, as well as you know reviewing all the feedback we get from you all and really determining what is the next step. How can the community foundation support the work that you wanna do? Um, I wanna emphasize again, we talked a little bit about funding. The community foundation has funding. But just like endowment funding, you may have it may be very heavily restricted. So we do have a handful of funds that have a small amount that's going specifically for religious groups, maybe to a specific church that a member was passionate about. But most of it is more for community-based programs. So if you are running an education program, probably one fund if it's a specifically religious education program. But if it's an after-school program, an enrichment program, a pre-K program, those kind of things, we have funds to support. Um, I, I brought with me uh, a list of just some of the, the grants we've made through the, um, the first you see in St. John's UCC funds, um, things like Burke's Youth Chorus, one of my favorites, Bethany Children's Home. We didn't try and make a big change in the community. They wanted to take their kids on summer field trips to be like a family vacation. So we helped fund that to give an opportunity for those kids. So. Lots of opportunities um, with us, and we're going to be looking at the feedback we get and how can we continue to help. Is it convening people like this? Uh, one of the questions on the survey is, what are our next steps? 
And then are you all interested in being on some kind of task force or steering committee to help direct some of the work that may need to be done in the community? So again, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. We will probably be organizing another walking tour for some downtown churches in the fall. So I'll, I'll email everybody about that. <laughs>